Hello, my name is Roger Curtis. I am the editor-in-chief at Royal House Comics. You can find us at our website, www.royalhousecomics.com, and you are watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by not only a talented author and writer, he is also the editor-in-chief of Royal House Comics with a huge staple of amazing, talented, creative people under his wing as well, too. We are joined today by the ever-talented Roderick Curtis. How are you doing today? Great. Thank you, Kurt, for that amazing intro. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I appreciate it. Well, I'm honored to have you here because I've had a lot more indie publishers or publishers in general on the show this year than I have in the past 14 years. And that is amazing personally for me to see because uh, from a publishing perspective, there is not that many publishers out there that want to showcase their talent. They just want to be kind of a business and they want to be able to, you know, occasionally pop up for say a Kickstarter campaign, but, but you're different. You have a great group of people from what I've seen from your website. And I'll let you describe all of these and wonderful talk to people during our interview. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, and of course, what you're here on two weeks talking for, who are you and what are you all about? Yeah, my, my name is Roderick Curtis. I um, have just uh, ventured into writing and authorship and, and self-publishing. I'm pretty, pretty well-rounded. I, I coach football. I'm a high school special education teacher. I, I have a minor in art, major in psychology. You know, like to read, like to ponder, uh, you know, philosophically. So uh, I have a lot of ideas, <laughs> you know, running around in my brain. And, um, you know, over the last year and a half, I decided to start actually writing. And I've had stories and um, concepts in my mind, but I never really you know, took the leap of becoming a creative and actually thinking about, you know, writing these stories down and taking them all the way to, to market. I had this idea in my mind uh, from our first book, Fred versus Priest, back in college in 2005. And I just, I just sat on it, just, um, you know, just always just kind of had this movie plan back. And I decided to write it in about two years ago. And it took me about 10 days to write a 120 page novel. Wow. And that was it. I, I literally couldn't look back after that. I decided, you know, Okay, I'll go on publish. I want to make a visual, so I made a comic. Then I just kind of got the bug and wanted to keep making comics and, and push this idea, make a way for others to to publish with me and to collaborate. How did Royal House Comics come about? Because it sounds like you're once you got the writing bug, you're like, I, I have this talent. You know, is there others that are out there? Like, hey, like how did Royal House Comics come come to be? It was so organic, and my writing journey started with Pharaoh versus Priests. That's like um, 18th Dynasty Egypt historical fantasy about Akhenaten and Nefertiti King Tut and that that family, that dynasty. I wrote the book and actually started making the comic um, with a Ukrainian a Ukrainian artist, um, prayers to him, uh, prayers to his safety. Um, and we, we made the first book. However, as I started researching successful publishing companies and even successful comic books, I saw the necessity for more content being able to to brand and expand and do more than just, you know, make a book and put it out. If I was gonna do this, I wanted to do it very well. I wanted to be the best that I could be at it. And I also wanted to open avenues to help others get to as far as I got to. Royal House started as a question on Facebook. I put out a, a question on a few Facebook groups said, who wants to build a publishing house? And I got a full range of responses from, you know, you're crazy. It's pay are you paying? You know, this is, is this a paid gig? You know, I only responded to people that said, you know, I'm interested. And the people that said they were interested, I got their email and we set up, you know, a first meeting. You know, I had a lot of, a lot of autonomy with, with my book, but with Royal House, I really had to open it up to ideas, levels of ownership and, and stake in where we were going and a voice. Um, so it really became organic and it started with just one person at that first meeting and another saying, Hey, I couldn't make it, but I'll be at the next one. Then the next one having, you know, three or four people, the next one having five to six people and just continuing to reach out, ended up settling on 11 creators, seven artists, four writers that span the globe, uh, three in the States, uh, several in Africa, uh, one in Belgium, um, by way of Angola. We are an 11 member collective of artists and writers 
that all have ownership. We're partners in Royal House Comics. Uh, we have ownership stake, even though our, our writers do pay the artists teams that we're working with. There's um, an exchange of value and they, they have ownership. So they bring down, you know, their prices in ratio. And we're able to, to produce at a very high rate with just having a ton of fun and working well together. And it's, everything is like no pressure type of environment. We really produce at a very, at a very high rate and level. It's only apropos to actually say, you know, who are your 11 creative people? Because I've seen your website. Your website is of course in the lower third as well too. But who are some of the, the creative talents that you have in your stable here? Oh, okay. So in the States, we have myself, great writer, Chuck Cox, who does like our horror, horror uh, spinoffs. We have a very talented designer. His name is Donald Lambert, goes by D Inks on Instagram. And he just does amazing black and white work and color, like bright color, but, but just incredible character designer. A world-class artist, Sikhan C. McComb, who has gone viral several times with our work, just an amazing colorist. Great Yukomo is one of our most dynamic artists. He's, uh, we're a meta shop, so we, we actually um, do work and help other creators create. So he's, he's led our, our NFT projects, as well as just dynamic um, artists in his own right. We have Daoud does this, these amazing like poses. If you see like, if you go through our Instagram and you see like this action where these two people are fighting, he probably did it. And he does this, this incredibly uh, uh, rich perspective of, of, of engagement and action. Uh, Leia, she's an artist that also wears like a producer hat because she does webtoons and she knows about, you know, that avenue. And we're trying to get into, you know, cross promote in webtoons and comics. Just, just an amazing artist. Toby is another one of our writers. Uh, Ishmael uh, is a writer, co-writer with me on Detective Rumble. Um, we have Joshua who does great pencil work. Sunday, um, who does all of our, our Dombe, he's our featured Dombe. If you look at the Dombe uh, title, he's like the main artist on that title. I hope I'm not leaving anybody out. <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I think, I think I got them all. And I believe this is your, your stable of the people you spoke yes. about. Yes. Toby, Donald, Sikansi, Ishmael. Yep. The person I usually leave out is myself because I, <laughs> I usually, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I really l love promoting our team. They are just incredible artists and I, you know, I double as like our marketer and, and promoter. So I'm always like throwing out their latest art or their promo or their, you know, panel pages. And I think people are looking like, man, this guy is like crazy productive. Um, but I always tag them. I'm always like, you know, featuring them. But if you're kind of just looking like, man, this, this guy has, has something dropping every week, but it's, it's, it's the team. <laughs> but it is about, you know, showcasing talent where, where credit, where credit is due. Plain and simple. I mean, you, you have a talented group of people working with you and the fact that they have their own vested interests in, of course, Royal House Comics and of course their own creative IPs as well too, kind of balances out as a, as a great collective, like what used to happen back in the day where you'd have a group of people just making comics. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's awesome to see truly. I find that, that fascinating. I found that it was actually pretty unique in the space where there are artists, writers that, that kind of do everything themselves. A lot of great artists, writers that put great work out there. There are, you know, producers that, you know, kind of wear the managerial hat and, and hire and contract artists on like a work for hire type of basis. Whereas we are a collective of, of partners really. And we work with that mindset, which is why uh, we've been in operation for a year and a half. We have three titles out. We have uh, three more that are like finishing up right now will be, you know, out kind of in the next few months, one back to back to back. And then there'll be two years, six titles under our belt, follow-ups coming down the road. So we really have a long-term aim, which is why how we work, how we communicate, um, you know, people feeling heard, able to bring value, take an idea and say, hey, like, let's all join in on that great idea, uh, really makes us a powerful group. And it's enjoyable to work with them. Are you going to have like cross promotion between the different comics, maybe as a like an overarching story, time travel type deal? So our um, it's not it's we we didn't do like this multiverse. Okay. There are subtle hints if you listen to this interview and you start looking at our comics. You know, as they start coming out, you might see a a newspaper heading in the background that has a reference to another comic. 
or you see these, you know, these these themes that are running through through books. Our horror comic um, anthology series coming out, Whispers from Black Boxes, that's headed and mainly written by Chuck Cox. His world has this interconnected space. Each series does have a six degrees of separation from the next, and it's that Stephen King kind of shared universe more so than like the uh, MCU type of thing. I was always curious about that because I've had a couple of people in the past where they literally created a universe of of their varying characters, of their varying different artists and, and writers and all that other stuff so that they're really interconnected with everything. But I, I love the fact that you're at least hinting in, in certain areas with certain comics. I, I mean, yes, the multiverse aspect is huge right now in, in comics and, and I'm sure it's been done <laughs> many many times in many different areas in the past as well too um but i think uh time travel is is also a fun way to to do about things rather than doing the whole multiverse so it it, you know it is we we're so early i mean we just have just a a backlog of great ideas kind of that we're looking to get to and we're looking to do many different things um but we want to be able to do them well and and have the right setup so uh, we got into these um, these different series that we're going to make sure we bring to to a close, you know, fin- finish the arc. I mean, we're really still building. We're really still developing, you know, it's like early Pixar, early any company, right? You, They're out there, they're doing their, their thing, but they're also growing at the same time. They're also getting feedback from their audience, right? So we imagine that, you know, two or three years from now, we may have our own universe. We may have our own time dimensions and, and things like that. Looking at yourself as a creative person, uh, especially a, as a writer, you know, what is the hardest part about this? The beginning, the middle, or the end of your process? Oh, I, I'd say the beginning, because I think that's where most people get caught up. And I, I spent 10 years at the beginning, just just sitting on a good idea. You know, whether it was good or not, it was something that was passionate to me and was always on my mind that I never felt like one, you know, didn't know how I can get it out to that confidence of whether it is good enough. And you, you tend to like compare yourselves to, to the premieres, to the, the Jordans of the comic book world, Marvel, DC, you know, your, is your character as good as Batman or, or Iron Man? I really had to come to grips with myself about like, what is my purpose in, in creativity? And it came down to my children. It came down to me being able to give this idea, which which was mine, and I had to realize nobody else had this idea. And if I put it out there, it would it would be a one of one, and um, it would be forever. Something that my kids could pick up a book and see little references of themselves in these little uh, trinkets and, and and interactions because I I use you know my life and my experiences as reference so um, they may not be in their name in the book we'll be able to tell and they'll be able to know a little bit about me so that's really where I took the, the leap to go ahead and write the book and to try to publish that took me to the second part which is like okay now that I'm doing this finding the information was so easy you know YouTube University will will you'll have so many people telling you about every single stage that you describe beginning middle and end um, so once I started actually researching, I saw normal people writing books. I saw normal people giving you the steps, you know, the steps to steps uh, process of it. And I just engaged in it, you know, from brainstorming and uh, uh, writing out uh, chapters and compiling and hiring an editor and, and getting it to where, you know, I took it to a, to a publisher and it was a hybrid publisher and there, you know, we started that process. But then I realized going back to like middle, in order to be a successful author, you need a crowd. In order to build a crowd, you have to have content. So it's kind of like this cart before the horse, chicken before the egg kind of kind of dynamic. So I was reading some authors that said you need to, you know, have three books in the can. Or, you know, if you're comics, you need three to six seri- you know, issues already in the can because comic fans and, and consumers want the next book. So I really found myself at like a crossroads of like, okay, I'm going to put a book out and nobody's going to buy it. Or, you know, how do I be so patient where I'm, you know, have one, two, three books and I haven't even engaged in, in building a crowd. So I guess that would put us in like the middle now where we're crowd building and content, you know, building content at the same time. So we put out promos, we put out 
promo art. We're in year two, and I'd say we're still in audience building. That's what is where I would say we are. Just project out what we do to as many people as possible. I started my own podcast in order to kind of have this cross pollination between creators, their audience, sharing my audience, and vice versa. Uh, Royal House Comics podcast. Oh, nice. <laughs> Branding, man. Branding, yeah. <laughs> yep. Branding. Everything we do is Royal House Comics. We're on Facebook, IG. So, you know, that put us in this middle. And I'll be honest, Kurt, we really feel like we have to break a lot of rules, like having three issues in the can before you release the first one, only focusing on one series, even down to like, you know, how many pages your book is or whether it's, you know, full color. We're really starting to look at every rule and say, you know what, why can we put out a three pager with cool art and some prose and, and just tell people that, Hey, it's a, it's a three pager. Look at this art and look at this message, right? People read funnies, people open the paper and look for the next Dilbert comic, right? That's not, uh, uh you know, super you know, impressive as far as what it's drawn, but how engaging is a Dilbert, you know, it's, it's decades, right? So this whole idea about what consumers want, I think people create this standard and, when you're building an audience, people really want, they want you. They want what you have to offer. So you create the rules for your audience as you're building it. And that's where, why I say we, we really are really feeling the freedom to do what we want to do. The rules change continuously. It's not like you have to abide by what other people have done because what they were successful in not necessarily works for those that have, are, are today because the technology of today is is way better in terms of especially reach social media presence digital content creation everything along that line you know having three issues or whatever of, of comics already made isn't necessary anymore because you can create a single issue you can promote the heck out of it on social media twitter instagram etc TikTok, even for that matter in small bite-sized pieces you can reach a large larger audience than you could if you went to comic conventions with three different books and say here you go i've seen that and i i know the models work right you know the marvels the dcs they become the model that every indie is trying to to feel like you know i need to follow those steps to replicate and i don't want to say every indie in a broad brush but many feel like I have to follow that, that road to success. And we're just trying to problem solve on a very individual basis, time, budget, content. I agree. I felt like we're just now starting to have the confidence and the audience would feel like, Hey, we can put it out an anthology of three, eight to 10 pagers in a compilation. You can read three different stories and, you know, just the value of a purchase in that content and whispers from black boxes is just going to be something different. There's nothing else like it out there, except for if you get it from Royal House Comics. And and talk about technology like social media and the way that you're able to monetize these social media platforms through like Patreon or um, just this marketplace, right? Facebook has a marketplace, get people to your links and they can buy your content. Even YouTube and like podcasts. An indie creator didn't used to have their own radio station or YouTube is literally your own TV station. And I talk to my group and people that I, you know, look to for advice and, and share my experience just about like how kind of easy marketing is. It's like literally just dollars, but you can pay Facebook to, to take your ad to, they'll ask you what you want, right? 10,000, you want to reach 10,000 people, you want to reach 100,000 people, whatever. It's literally just money to get, you know, your, your content out in front of people. So this gatekeeping is, is really no longer um, a reality. I think we're back to zero about like what we can do. What are the opportunities for us? You don't have to pay for marketing. And here's, here's why I say that. If you're creating content, especially when it comes to, to art, artistic content specifically, like comics, that is the easiest form of marketing that you can do in terms of promotion. Because people will look at pictures more so than they will look at ads. And I say that also because with a podcast that you have with the content that you are creating along with your team in terms of Royal House Comics, you are continuously promoting yourself through any post you create. And that draws the audience in, that draws the brands in, and that draws, you know, name recognition in, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to pay social media platforms like Facebook to market yourself is utterly ridiculous. And I personally think it's a waste of money. 
because you can do a TikTok one minute video and you can reach thousands of people, especially if you do a creative process video of your comic, of, of your style of whatever, than you can with a Facebook targeted ad. I think the effectiveness of Facebook ads really uh, ebbed. <laughs> It really ebbed as of lately because of, of, like you said, people taking just the platform itself and utilizing it at a very high level. Where I use that example and really where that's not really where we're at, we're thinking more of like hard marketing mm -hmm. when we get there. Like when we have our content and our, our portfolio the way we want it, we're thinking about like, hey, we want to get on channel 11. Hey, we want to get on um, a billboard that's right in front of the Staples Center. I'm, I'm from L.A. Oh, yeah. Right. That's kind of where I feel like indies don't make that jump into like hard marketing and you can do a lot with social media marketing. And we're trying to exploit that to, to its fullest. A few years down the road, when we have two or three issues per series, we've expanded about six to 10 uh, series. We want to double back into just some hard marketing. I just told my, my partner this the other day, there'll be people two years from now, thousands, tens of thousands, millions of people that have no idea who we are. And they'll be exposed to the very first book for the very first time. Hey, it's your business. Um, I just really think it's it comes down to, you know, utilize your social media more and you'll be more effective with, with that type of marketing, especially with today's youth, especially looking into comics. And if you tag it right, then you're golden. So well, I think the important thing, though, is like um, back to like the original question about like what's the beginning, middle and end. Right. We're nowhere near. We're nowhere near the end yet. Uh, I'd say we're still at the beginning, and there's so many challenges for indie creators to figure out how to how to go about it. I think somebody said like, if you actually publish a book, you're like ninety percent. You're like, you know, in the ten percent of people that can actually have an idea and take it to to market. Hmm. So you know, you you have to find a way to problem solve for your own business, like you said. I mean, with self-publishing nowadays and the, and the cost of, of book creation with through uh, print on demand and everything like that, I mean, the, the ability to print your own content is way easier than it was 10 years ago. That's for sure. The quality has definitely increased as well, too. So, you know, I, I find it always fascinating that, you know, you can take an idea, you can find an amazing artist uh, online and you can get your content out there. And, and it's just it's a great time to be a geek. It's a great time to be a, a, a creative person like yourself. And I can't wait to see what you do in the future for sure. But let, we could, uh, we could easily wax poetic about the, the process and the business, because that just means I have to have you back on. We'll talk just strictly the business and, and oh, yeah. we'll you, dive into you, you said it from your, from your mouth to my ears. <laughs> hey. Have you back on, man. <laughs> hey, look, I'm always up for, for, uh, you know, interesting and engaging people like yourself as well too, Roderick. So don't, Thanks. don't, don't feel like you, you have to limit yourself when in terms of your your business and your creativity and, and i'd love to have your other guests your other um uh team members on the show in there, the future so i'll tell you this kurt uh, so we you know when when the team got together uh we started off kind of as like individual teams so hey all right you writer art you have a great idea writer we're gonna pair you with this artist and this artist hey you know this team is gonna be working on don bay this team is gonna be working on detective rumble this team is, uh, you know, following up on the next series sync that we have coming up or, or, you know, one of the other titles that we have coming up where now we're actually figuring out the process for like all working on one project. Mm. And we have a project called Escrima, which is our first, we're, we're in the call to action contest and we're putting up a, a new series Escrima, which is like, if you seem like uh, Colombian or Haitian, like machete fencing, that's, that's what it's, it's also a huge Filipino uh, martial art, Escrima. Um, they're all kind of connected in style and, and tradition. The one that we are focusing on is more like that Afro-Latino culture of, of machete fencing and just rich history. And we've figured out a way, we're experimenting a way to like have all hands on deck on one project. And it's very exciting. We feel like we can compete um, for the top prize because we have everybody like like this assembly line development now where you have a storyboard, pencil, ink, color, post-production. And it's really exciting to see kind of, kind of what we can do with that, that new format. So then as a creative person that you are, you know, what is your creative kryptonite? Ooh, I'd say, um, the next idea, <laughs> 
right? So you, you have a good idea and you, you start the process, you're brainstorming, you're, you're uh, laying out characters, you're researching, and then something about that idea or just another influence, you know, sparks another, you know, seed that you want to you wanna plant. And, you know, so I wouldn't say it's the kryptonite, but it's something that can kind of lead you away from a, a forward direction and momentum. I'd say my kryptonite is, as a creative, is that I actually like marketing. I actually enjoy marketing. I like, so I, I find myself marketing more and have to like put myself back in like the, the writing component, mm -hmm. get so caught up in building the audience and, and, you know, doing these different ventures, the podcasts, where my kryptonite becomes time, time management. As I said earlier, I'm also a head football coach for high school. I'm also a teacher, full-time job. I also have three kids and, and, and a, you know, a family, a you know, fiance. So balancing the time to create is something that um, I don't think it's an easy fix. It's something that always, I think, can get in the way of a creative. And I think most creators, most creatives, they get hit with that kryptonite really hard and they find themselves in a regular job because they don't think the creative pursuit is something that can turn them into Superman. So they just stay Clark Kent. That's a good analogy. I like that. <laughs> being a football coach and, and being a, a teacher and, of course, being a creative person that you are and, and business owner with, of course, you know, Royal House Comics. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Oh, my goodness. I'd say language, um, audible language, as well as like body language, I guess, you know, energy or whatever, you know. Uh, actions are, are a form of language. As a little kid, being inspired to even play football at all. And I ended up living a football life. I played it through youth, high school, college, and then didn't take one year of break, went right into coaching. So I've had this unbroken chain of football since I was seven years old. And it started with a camp counselor giving me a ball, seeing me catch, and just giving me some words of encouragement or like, you know, getting excited for me. And I was, I just, that feeling just stuck with me. The power of language to inspire cannot be understated. I practice that. And even with my own team, as far as just feeding them confidence when they're making mistakes, articulating that, you know, what the learning can be from it and staying in that positive mindset. Language can, can be so powerful for good or, or for evil, you know, they used to call it magic, right? I, this, I got this during my, my fair versus priest research kind of about Egyptian alchemy, but this whole concept of magic start, you know, started with you know, language, voice, being able to articulate ideas, because in that um, comes the creation where you can have an idea and create it. You can make it physical, tangible, and it started with just, you know, a, an idea. So that is the power of language and, and it's, I think we're just scratching the surface of it. So what are some of the themes that you've learned about when you were researching Pharaoh versus priest that, that maybe took you in a completely different direction during your research? Well, that alchemy is the refinement, not of, of tin to gold, but is actually the refinement of the human soul. All the power and things that we, you know, can do and make are, um, I guess the lower tier uh, of what this experience is supposed to be. And Egyptian alchemy um, is, is a holistic uh, pursuit. If you, if you're able to kind of see, see it and see the connections in, in other philosophies um, that I, I, I dived into and was able to kind of like kind of sparked, spark my interest. You know, as I started doing the research, and, and research in e Egypt and Egyptology is just such a rabbit hole. I did a, a, a podcast with a self uh, a self educated uh, Egyptologist, and and she was saying how like you can spend your entire life, your entire career, uh, uh, going down this avenue of, of archaeology or thought in Egypt, and it could just be completely cut off and and like upended and, and that actually is not the way it would because people are finding new things all the time up under uh, uh, as they're excavating and interpreting and as we're as we're kind of making these connections as more information is coming out so i learned how utterly ridiculous egyptology can be 
in, in, in moments and how there's so much room for me to just to fill it with my imagination. <laughs> so no, uh, Pharaoh versus Priest, I wouldn't say is a historical document. Um, it's, it follows uh, Akhenaten, who some say was like this Moses figure, like one of the, he changed the pantheon from multiple gods to one god. And uh, I just dived into the history, the lore, the philosophy uh, of Atenism and decided, you know what, there's, there's a lot here, but there's also a lot missing that I'm just going to fill with just a fantastic love and adventure story. What was a, a comic that you read that made you cry? I got to admit, uh, it's, it's not a, I don't think I read it in physical form, but, but in game, very tear jerking, <laughs> the whole Iron Man, uh, uh, death scene. I think they built that up and executed that. And the actors delivered that in a way that's like, I felt like it was real and it was so much invested that like, oh my goodness, that was just such a, a sentimental moment that I can really relate to beyond just comic movie, just a movie just an experience, just a, like an investment in time and like these characters that just, uh, just, just amazing cinema. At what point are we good enough? Immediately, you were born a gift to the world. I think the world, you know, as you're a baby kind of has this duty and obligation to cultivate your infinite amazingness. And it's the world sometimes that fails. Uh, it's the surroundings sometimes that can't catch up to how important the life that was just born is you're born enough the journey is getting to a point where we know that we're enough and then can we thrive can we take you know that our just base ability which is incredible and expand it and make an impact on others how do you think the birth of creativity was formed and through curiosity through curiosity about about making connections filling that void of the known with what you think and, and just like our power to create something from nothing something we undervalue i think as as humans we're on a computer right now talking through virtual space and a hundred years ago, 50 years ago, this, this wasn't something that was real, but you saw it on the Jetsons. You saw it on the Jetsons a long time ago, flying cars, Leonardo da Vinci and beyond, right? The, before the pyramids were built, somebody was thinking like, I want to do this. And somebody told them they were crazy and they were like, you know what? I can figure it out. I can figure out how to move these blocks. That was their gift to the world. So I think creativity is, is kind of rooted in that first question about like, are we enough? We, we're just born with so much power that we're just, just tapping into the surface. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? Ooh. You know, I, I, I want to go the cliche, you know, my, I, I came from just a family of love like, you know, my, I was fortunate where, where, you know, my um, surroundings when I was a youth cultivated that in me, you know, so my mom, my dad, my brothers, um, as a creative, I got to give credit to the team or the, or the, of uh, the generation of nineties creators, X-Men, the comics in the nineties, when I was a youth and looking for, for you know, visual stimulation, they just hit it out the box. You know, G.I. Joe, Transformers, like I was just enthralled in the TV. When I went to the comic shops, I just was so attracted to to the content that was coming out. X-Men, you know, I, I loved like Night Thrasher, these, this expansion of, of, of representation in comics when I was a youth. So I can't really identify one person but it was that it was that generation of creatives when I was eight to twelve years old that were producing and inspiring me as a youth. From a professional standpoint, you are working with eleven amazing, talented, creative people like yourself, publishing great comics, of course, with Royal House Comics, and you are all creating comps, which is amazing to see. I mean, just, just talking about it here today, I, I hear the passion in your voice and, and I can't wait to talk with those other people as well too in the future, because I'm sure they have wonderful stories to tell as well. So professionally, you are all successful. Do you consider yourself personally successful? I want to say yes. I believe there's a range of success. And I, I actually talked about this in one of my interviews lately about just how Success is actually this balancing of work-life balance, individual pursuits and passions, 
um, as well as sacrificing some of those for those that you love, like your, you know, your children, your, your loved ones, your, your family, because you have to extend, extend that to them as well, or else that will, you'll find them if you, if you don't, you know, those relationships start to falter and that actually pulls, pulls your, your energy and your happiness down. So I do feel like I am balancing that better now. And I think the monetary success will come as a result of me able to sustain in the creative process and keep creativity as part of that work-life balance. I do think I'm successful and that we're successful in that we are are continuing to operate a good headspace. We, we have a joy working together. Um, we have forward momentum. We don't get hung up on really anything because we have this open communication. Um, so I think we're successful where many other teams maybe have faltered and can we sustain that to actually achieve when you ask me about beginning, middle, end, I think the end is going to look so wonderful for us. I think we're successful in the process. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I lean into it with my chin, just hit me with it because I is so part of, of the path to success. And I think people, I see the way we move is like fast and reckless and you know, maybe we even blunder sometimes, right? But we're moving, we're moving forward. You know, you actually can't have a wave without an ebb. You can't just like crest <laughs> with any long-term momentum, right? You have to have an ebb in order to have a, a, a flow. That's the way waves work. If you're moving, you're likely going to have a misstep. You're likely going to have some, some failure, but in that failure is the learning. So without the learning, you, you don't grow. So you can't grow without failure is the full equation. So knowing that equation, I tend to lean in, right? In, like hit me with it. Let me, let me run as fast as I can into the wall. Oh, there's a wall here. What is it made of? You know, it, it hurt. It's hard. Uh, how do I get around it? How do I go through it? But I'm definitely going to continue running into that next wall. Oh, I love your analogies. These are great. These, <laughs> this is like perfect, like TikTok type material. This is beautiful. Like The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way. And the fact that you have the younger generation with you and they are going to be creative in some way, shape or form, whether it's as a comic writer, artist, or maybe something creative that you don't know about in the future. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Ooh. I think they can inspire them by sharing their process. As I mentioned earlier, most people never make it out of their head. They never are given that, that lift up to think they're good enough, or if they do the how to of it for the next generation, continue to teach, continue to expose all the ups and downs of the process and encourage them through the adversity. If your life was a movie, what would its title be and what would the soundtrack be oh oh my goodness that is fun and a very hard on the spot question to come up with something good so i you know i guess it would be something along the lines of uh <laughs> i want to say it's been funny like scent of a woman or something like i don't know <laughs> like, like i don't know <laughs> just because it's my favorite movie yeah, that's good <laughs> um, yeah. yeah the princess bride I and mean, i want something super super uh like uh mundane but so powerful in the you know in it because i i'm a, I, I i pride myself on being very like normal and average and approachable in many ways but also like to balance the fact that i'm not normal and i have these incredible ideas that are unique and probably nobody else has so i guess uh i guess the title would be like full speed ahead or something like that because I'm, I'm i'm really in a space where i want to do everything that i have dreams of and nothing's going to stop me i wanted to be a teacher I teach. I wanted to be a head football coach. I'm a head football coach. I wanted to make a comic. I make comics. And really, I'm at this point in my life where I'm, nothing's going to stop me. And then you say, what would be the soundtrack? Sade. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> Roderick, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much, Kurt. That was, that was an amazing, fun interview. I really appreciate you and your show. Before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you online and on, on social media? Uh, on social media, everything is Royal House Comics. You can, we have our own Facebook group. Um, we're on Instagram, TikTok. Get to our, our content through our website. We self-publish at www.royalhousecomics.com. 
and you can see our titles. You can leave uh, your email so you can notify when the next title is coming out. And uh, www.royalhousecomics.com is where you can find all of our content. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash tgtmedia, because that's a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person. Give me a break, folks, will you? Other than that, I want to thank you for listening and watching for all these years as well, too. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.